Welcome back to my response to this truly wretched creation science video. We don't find marine creatures such as fish, clams, and corals buried and fossilized on the seafloor where they once lived. Huh. Instead, we find most of them buried in a sedimentary rocks on the continents, even on high mountains. For that to happen, the ocean waters had to totally flood the continents. And I would even suggest recede somewhat rapidly, and that's exactly what the Bible describes. Okay, you've made the assertion, for there to be any fossils of marine life in sedimentary rock high up on mountains, your assertion is that ocean waters have to completely flood the continents and then rapidly recede. Okay, I understand the claim, so now all you have to do is tell me why. Why is it necessary? Why is this a better explanation than plate tectonics? Plate tectonics works. It's a perfectly fine explanation, and it fits observable facts today of the movement of continental plates. But it can be falsified as the reason for these fossils on these mountains. You say that these fossils on these mountains require complete continental flooding and rapid recession of the water. So there's your claim to prove. Prove that they do, in fact, require that. Can you give a reason? Can you give any actual reason why that's a requirement? Why any process that could possibly be proposed that could wind up with those fossils being placed in those locations are immediately, necessarily invalidated completely because they don't include complete continental flooding? You've said a thing. You've said, no, you're wrong because it has to be like this, but I'm not hearing any reason why it has to be like that. So explain that first so that we can eliminate plate tectonics as the cause of this, and then we can move on to analyzing your idea. You know, to consider it as a potential successor to plate tectonics as the explanation. I mean, we're not just going to accept it without discussion. We're going to have to actually make sure that this idea works better. Now, I'm seeing an awful lot of issues with your idea. The deposition of this amount of sediment, specifically most of the Himalaya mountains, in one year by effectively ocean water in this remarkably jagged configuration, in one narrow corridor instead of more evenly around India and Tibet, which despite being in a soaking wet underwater pile of mud retains its jagged form during and after the recession of the water, and which then is fully converted from basically mud into all the different kinds of rocks on the Himalaya mountains, and the life forms are converted into fossils in, sorry, I think I said 6,000 years before, no, 4,000 years. Before I accept what you're saying here, I'm going to need to understand all of that, because all of that sounds incredibly implausible. I'm going to need to see some actual mechanisms by which this is happening. And God done it could be an answer. God could just sort of mold the Himalayas into the shape he wants and snap them into limestone and other kinds of rock, snap all the fish and shells and shit into fossils. But in that case, you don't even need the flood to explain it. Now you've just got God done it to explain it, and the flood can go hang. And beyond that, of course, then what you have on your hands is something that, unlike plate tectonics, is unfalsifiable. And as we all know, if it's not falsifiable, it's not scientific. So I think you're going to have to get a little more scientific here if you want to maintain the flood as a necessary component and have an actual valid scientific theory that's worth anybody paying attention to. And for that, I don't think it's going to be sufficient to just stand there with a copy of Answers Magazine calling yourself a knucklehead. You're probably going to actually have to think for yourself for once. We find ammonite fossils, squids with shells, in limestone layers high up on the Himalayas in Nepal, near the top of Mount Everest. Yeah, I know. I think most people know that. That's kind of common knowledge. That's the kind of stuff you read in those dumb little trivia books and stuff. Maybe, maybe somebody brought him up there. I know, Ken Ham. He went up the mountain and he just put him there so that you got that evidence. It's a whole scam. What it is. Yes, yeah, that's right. My Bible is true. Why do you love hearing this and others hate it? Why do your audience love hearing it and everyone else hates it? Because when you read it to them, they dumbly smile and nod because it confirms what they want to believe and they don't really care beyond that. And everyone else asks questions. Those goddamn pesky questions. Ah! It explains why our world is the way that it is. Yeah, except all those questions that I asked you about it, and by the way, all the questions anyone might put in the comments section, which is probably a whole lot more, you didn't even try to answer. You didn't even think to ask. You have no theory here. You have nothing. 
You haven't bothered to ask yourself the most basic fundamental questions about what this actually means in the real world, what you're proposing, about how it would actually play out in real life. You haven't explained how any individual part of it works. You've just said that's what happened. A flood did it all somehow. Good enough for me. I'm done. I've explained the entire world now. How does any of it work? Uh, I'm no science guy. I'm not into science and all that science type stuff. I'm just a simple-minded, knucklehead genius. I've got all the answers if you never ask me any questions. We find marine fossils in most rock layers exposed in the Grand Canyon walls in Arizona. Yep, so based on what we've gone over so far, what do you think my answer is going to be for the likely reason why that is? It's going to be okay, that implies that at some point in history there was an ocean there. In fact, for quite some time. And then what do you think I'm going to say when you say, Ah, uh, no, it was a global flood and I like my idea better. The flood just picked up all the sediment and then dumped it all down at once in a year with all kinds of different animals that the water picked up all randomly stuck all through it. And then it all hardened into all kinds of different kinds of rocks super fast in layers. Except also it made a big canyon in it for some reason. When you say that, what do you think my answer is going to be? I mean, I've pretty much already told you the answer. My answer is going to be to hit you with a whole bunch of questions that point out the inconsistencies and the gaps in information. In this case, for example, why did it get laid down in layers like that? Why do we find such a clear fossil progression through the layers? Why, for something so random, does it seem so non-random? And why did all these sea creatures get picked up and moved over to goddamn Arizona, but there's no sign of land animals in the same layers at all? And why, if what we're talking about is a bunch of mud laid down all at once by a global global flood, and then the water ran off to somewhere, why do we have this steep-sided canyon? Why did it not all just slump into the middle? In fact, why is the canyon there in the first place? That'd probably be where I'd start with this one, but please, geologists or people with better geological understanding than I have, come up with lists of questions that are better than mine. I mean, already I think these questions are going to be pretty hard for him to answer, but I bet there's a whole lot that could be asked that would be a whole lot tougher. That's why. I don't know who runs it. I haven't been to the Grand Canyon. I think I flew over it. Somewhat recently, it was off in the distance, and the pilot didn't come on to say, uh... uh oh my god, just stop, please. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Boo, you suck. To your left would be the Grand Canyon. Uh... Get off the stage. Uh... Bing! That was the bell sound. Please do an open mic, and film it, and put it on YouTube. Thank you. By the way, that's right. That's my vocal range. Number two evidence of a global flood, massive fossil graveyards around the world. Okay, interesting. So there are some areas where there are a bunch of fossils, all together or close together, either implying a situation where an unusual number of animals were dying at the same place, either at the same time or across time, or a place that's exceptionally good at preserving fossils. Okay, interesting enough subject. Certainly nothing new to geologists or paleontologists. Just thinking about it, I can't quite picture how this would possibly serve as evidence for a global flood. The fact that there are some small local areas where there are lots of fossils. I mean, if we were going to attribute it to a flood, it would be a local flood in those areas, you would think. Well, explain it. Maybe I'm missing something. Number three. Wait, whoa, whoa. Hey, now. Hold your horses. Is that all the magazine had for number two? Just, there are fossil graveyards. Moving along. Just a header. There are fossil graveyards. They put a header there for a placeholder and then they forgot to write the actual little section about it. Is that what happened? Okay, just to be clear, do you pay these people for this magazine or do they give it to you for free? Number three, exquisitely preserved fossils. Whatever, I guess. We're just moving on to number three. Fossil graveyards, we'll just keep it as not being evidence for a global flood, because of course no reason was presented why it should be. And I can think of plenty other far more parsimonious explanations that don't involve global floods. So what was number three? Exquisitely preserved fossils? Okay, well that kind of goes with number two, I suppose. The second possibility I brought up, right? It implies that in certain cases there are conditions that are exceptionally good for preserving a fossil, which again is very well known. Obviously. Paleontology, not exactly a new science anymore. Why would very good fossil preservation in some cases require or imply a global flood? In fact, I would kind of guess that the extreme disastrous nature of an event like that would probably make it harder for fossils to be really well preserved. But that's just an intuition. Some squids with fossili are, were fossilized with ink 
still in their ink sacs. Yeah, from back in 2012, direct chemical evidence for eumelanin pigment from the Jurassic period. Interesting stuff, clearly an exceptionally well-preserved specimen. Stuff like this is such a big deal because it's so incredibly rare. And that's kind of the point. Like, what is your assertion? What is the actual argument you want to formulate? Is it, the fossils we find are young and therefore stuff in them is preserved in ways that it would not be were the fossils older? Is that the assertion? Because again, in almost every fossil ever found, this does not exist. Nothing like this. This is a truly exceptional outlier. It's not the norm by any stretch of the imagination. So if that really is your argument, this should not be so rare. But what this implies is a very rare and very special set of conditions. It makes a lot of sense though that something like this would show up in a fossil of a squishy invertebrate, like a cuttlefish-like creature. Because fossils of soft tissue are already extremely rare. That already requires extremely special circumstances just to fossilize that. So even as a baseline, if we have a fossil of this kind of animal at all, we already have a very special, very rare, very efficient fossilization. It's not just the pigment, none of this is common. And so I have more questions about what your claim even is. Is your claim that this should be much more common in a global flood scenario? Well, it's not common. At all. Is your claim that it's only possible on short timescales? That it's only possible that this fossil could have begun forming 4,000 years ago, not 160 million years ago or whatever it is? If so, why? Specifically why? You're going to have to delve into the actual conditions under which this fossil was created and then explain why those conditions can only maintain a fossil in this condition over a 4,000 year timescale. Is Answers in Genesis going to do that? Well, I think we're going to find out, and I'd bet money on the answer. And in a classic example of rapid burial... Oh, look at that. They're moving on immediately to a different one. If I had bet money that the answer was no, I would have won. Why do you believe this junk, Todd? Have you ever considered asking a question? And in a classic example of rapid burial... And... It's like... Dude, they teach you how to sound out words in kindergarten. What are you doing? And... Ix, Ix, yo, sir. There you go, little toddy. That's how you do it. Well done. Here's a gold star. A marine reptile, apparently. Bro, what were you spending your time doing as a kid? It cannot possibly be rare for people to be super into ancient reptiles when they're a kid. And ichthyosaurs are like one of the main ones. Of the marine ones. I mean, okay, let's be real, among the most famous ones, they're not exactly top tier in coolness. They kind of look like a Down Syndrome dolphin. <laughs> I say that with all due sensitivity and respect, okay? In fact, <clears throat> I say it merely as a statement of my opinion on the facts of the matter. It's a neutral observation. Although on second thought I might be wrong, I think a dolphin looks more like a Down Syndrome ichthyosaur. About six feet long was fossilized at the moment it was giving birth. How does that happen? Boom! It happens when it dies while it's giving birth and then gets fossilized. How else do you think? That would apply whether there was a global flood or not. Whether it died 4,000 years ago or 250 million years ago. What are you on about? Something caught it and overwhelmed it and fossilized it. Not necessarily. Sometimes things just die when they're giving birth. But yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe it was giving birth and some other animal came along and caught it and overwhelmed it and killed it. And that's why it died. I don't know, who cares? Point is, it died. Seriously, what is the argument here for a global flood? I mean, it's like if you walk up to me and you say, hey, did you know that an elephant died once? It was in the process of being alive, and then it wasn't anymore. How does that happen? Boom! Aliens built the pyramids! A flood did that. Wait, what caught it and overwhelmed it was a flood. I don't understand, does it show evidence of being buffeted around by a flood while it's giving birth? I mean, all you've said is, it's an ichthyosaur and it died while it was giving birth. What's the evidence a flood did it? Besides, I mean, the thing lives in the ocean, the last thing I'm gonna think is gonna kill it is a flood. You're really gonna have to help me out with visualizing that one, and then point out the actual evidence for it. What a video, oh my god. Only the catastrophic global flood could rapidly bury so many large creatures in layers that are so extensive. Todd, it's an ocean creature. There are plenty of circumstances in the ocean where a dead animal can be buried by sediment before its bones disappear. So the ichthyosaur is not a puzzle. What is a puzzle is how you phrase that. How so many large animals can be rapidly buried in layers that are so extensive. As if you're just assuming, what, that all the layers had to be laid down at the same time? I don't know, I don't even know what's being claimed. This article is 
so terribly written, I don't even know what they're trying to argue about half the time. I don't know, maybe it's just trying to say rapid burial is rare and the layers thing is just an afterthought. In which case, yeah, rapid burial is rare. And rapid burial with the conditions that produce fossils is even more rare. That's why for every fossil that's found, there are millions upon millions of animals that did not fossilize. It's a rare event. Which, by the way, would be a big point against the global flood if it really laid down so much material on top of all the animals. You would think in that case fossils would be incredibly common globally. Rapid burial would have been the norm for every single animal alive during that time period. And in fact it would have been rapid burial mostly while the soft tissues were still intact. You would expect to find a lot more dinosaur skin, fossilized innards, fossilized soft tissue. And fossils of animals with no skeletons wouldn't be so incredibly rare. But instead, relative to the number of animals it takes to populate the world, they're very rare, and often localized to hotspots, like you said, the fossil graveyards. Which implies that there were some areas which were exceptionally good at preserving fossils, and many, 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 many more which were not. That implies that local conditions were responsible, not global ones. And fossilization of soft tissues is extremely rare. None of the features of what we see in the real world with regard to fossils are matching up with this scenario that you're proposing. And that's not even to mention, of course, that fossils form far too slowly for those all to have been formed in 4,000 years. You guys have no idea what fossilization even is, or how it works. That's why you get idiots like Kent Hovind and Carl Baugh showing calcified hats and boots and stuff as evidence of rapid fossilization. They don't actually even know what the word means. Number four. Sediments spread around the continents, covering vast areas every continent. Sedimentary rocks laid down by the catastrophic flood conditions. Catastrophic flood conditions? Why are we assuming that? Flood conditions, sure, as in oceans, as in lakes. In North America, the Western Interior Seaway, for example, that divided east from west. I mean, again, real scientists are not proposing that the world is a static ball that's never changed. Continents move, they collide, they split, oceans appear, disappear. The idea that in the past there were large bodies of water in places that now don't have that is not controversial. As a matter of fact, you're basically just taking the position of geology, except instead of saying, hey, there was a large body of water in this place, you're saying, there was a large body of water in this place, and therefore there was a large body of water everywhere at the same time, all around the world, only 4,000 years ago, for some reason. In other words, you're filling it up with a whole hell of a lot of assumptions that don't need to be there. Many of these sediment layers can be traced all the way across the continents, and even between continents. What is the scientific explanation for that? Plate tectonics. From an evolutionary standpoint, which of course denies, well... Pretty much everything in Genesis and everywhere else. Just to be clear, what of the actual facts of anything you've said so far have I disagreed with? Or which of it does evolutionary science, which just means anything that's not young earth creationism, which of it does that disagree with? Let me just quickly review your claims. Marine fossils exist on some mountains. Marine fossils exist in the Grand Canyon. There are fossil graveyards in some places. There was a fossilized squid-like animal that had ink still. There was a fossilized ichthyosaur that was giving birth when it died. Rapid burial is important for fossilization. Geologic layers link up between continents sometimes. Which of these is not acknowledged and explained within mainstream science? None of these is shocking. None of these is news. It would probably blow your mind to read a modern geology or paleontology textbook. What? They knew all the things I mentioned and explained them? Thoroughly? How can this be? I thought I was BTFOing them with facts they'd never heard of. Your absolute failure to bother to find out even what facts your opponents are aware of is why you keep losing. And it's why it's going to keep happening. This is proof that God flooded the world as he said. What is? Nothing you've said is. Just saying, hey, there's an ichthyosaur that died giving birth, that's not proof of a global flood. If you want to convince people that it is proof of a global flood, you're going to have to actually make an argument. Do you notice how nowhere in this stupid article that he's reading there's an argument to be found? Nowhere. It's just, hey, here's a thing. Okay, next thing. And this should lead us to adopt your explanation for it. Why? Specifically why? I won't even ask how it uniquely supports a global flood, because it doesn't necessarily have to. Of course, each individual piece of evidence could be explained in multiple different ways. The more important question is, how does the global flood explain all of these observations together better than anything coming out of geology and paleontology? And beyond that, how does it explain all the other observations made by geologists and paleontologists better than any of the explanations proposed by the geologists and the 
the paleontologists. Do you think they just haven't explained these things? Do you think they have no idea how this could possibly be resolved and so they just pretend that the stuff you're mentioning doesn't exist? What you're proposing is to completely overturn multiple different scientific theories which are extremely well established and extremely good at explaining what they set out to explain. Ones which readily explain every single fact that you've brought up here. And then replace those theories with theories of your own that at this point appear poorly defined at best. This is not a task for some BuzzFeed type listicle. The only people the listicle is going to impress are the subscribers to AIG. But then again, that is the only point to any of this. Well, once again, I've reached what feels like a good place to stop. I'm pretty sure I'll make another part, finish it up. But for now, thank you very much for watching. If you would be so kind, please give the video a like and click subscribe if you haven't. Massive thanks to all of my supporters on every platform. For early access, sign up to the email list, list.logic.com, and I will see you next time.